presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Is Idaho now the reddest of red states? Sure seems like it might be after this week's election. So what went right for the Republicans, so to speak, and why did Democrats suffer losses? We'll talk about the election results with the leaders of both the Democrat and Republican parties in Idaho, and we'll take your phone calls. Stay tuned. Dialogue is next. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Republicans scored big victories across the country on election night and Idaho was no exception. Every statewide office is now held by the GOP, which also picked up five seats in the Idaho State House as well. Here to talk about the vote count and its potential effects are Norm Simanko, chair of the Republican Party, and Keith Work, chair yeah. of the Democratic Party. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. A bit more about my guests, in addition to their duties as chairman of their respective parties, they're both attorneys and they've both run for office. Mr. Simanko sits on the Eagle City Council and is the executive director and general counsel of the Idaho Water Users Association. In 2006, he ran as a Republican for the 1st Congressional District, but lost in the primary election. Mr. Rourke is the founder and senior partner of Rourke Law Firm with offices in Haley and Twin Falls. He's a former prosecuting attorney and a former mayor of Haley. In 2002, Mr. Rourke was the Democratic candidate for state attorney general and lost to the current attorney general, Lawrence Waston. So these are two individuals who know both sides of the elections business, and they're here to answer your questions or your comments. Call us toll-free at 1-800-973-9800. Well, first, uh, to you, Mr. Semenko, is Idaho now the reddest of the red states? I mean, if you look at, if, if we take as, a, as an arbiter statewide offices and legislatures. Well, Marsha, in some ways it's kind of like answering the, the bowl championship series question of who's really the number one team in the country. But uh, certainly there's only a select few states that have all of their congressional delegation Republican, all of their constitutional officers Republican. Uh, Idaho and Wyoming both fit that. 81% uh, of Idaho's legislature is Republican, 84% of Wyoming's legislature is Republican. So they may claim to be a little more red than us, uh, but we're, we're both in that same category. And, and there's a slew of other states that are, that are, that are right behind Utah, uh, Oklahoma as well. Okay, well, let's uh, start with one of the big races, the first congressional. Mr. Rourke, two years ago, you were here on this very set with the uh, same counterpart, and you're very happy about the big win, Walt Minnick in the U.S. House. Now, the numbers from this year's election, as we know, are much different. We can put them up on the screen. Let's look at the graphic. Uh, Raul Labrador took this uh, race, 51 percent to 41 percent over Mr. Minnick. Um, before we talk about why this might have happened, Mr. Semenko, I'm going to play a quote from you from two years ago, again, on this dialogue program, something that you said uh, in the context of this race. What's going to be interesting, trying to move forward here a little bit, is uh, the Democrats now have firm control of Congress, not quite uh, filibuster-proof in the Senate, but close, and they are going to have the presidency. So, you know, sometimes be careful what you ask for. The total responsibility and uh, whatever happens, good or bad, they're going to be held accountable. So, again, that was two years ago. You look pretty much the same, by the way. Congratulations. <laughs> um, in your sense, now is was Mr. Minnick's loss due to discontent with President Obama? As you said, you know, when you win, you win big like the Democrats did last time around, you're held accountable. Or do you think it was something else? Uh, I'll, I'll well, I, I certainly think it was a combination of things. Um, the economy is bad, and uh, Raul Labrador very firmly talked about the need for jobs, for improving the economy made the case that over the last two years while Walt Minnick's been in Congress, uh, we've not seen those jobs. And he, he constantly, Raul did, said, where are the jobs, Mr. Minnick? So that was a big part of it. Uh, also, when Walt was elected, he didn't have a voting record in Congress, obviously. Now he does have a voting record. So there were some votes that Raul was able to point at uh, in terms of the record. And then there's no doubt that the phenomenon of fire Pelosi across the country, uh, the notion that we need a change in Congress and, and tying uh, Walt Minnick's vote for Nancy Pelosi as speaker, that that had something to do with it as well. What's your sense of why your candidate lost? Well, it, you know, it's hard to appear on the same program with a prophet, and uh, I have to say Norm was fairly prophetic uh, in our last session. When unemployment hovers between 9 and 10 percent, 
for two years, then the party in power is going to pay for it. That was no different this year than at any other year where unemployment has been at levels that high. And I think when all is said and done, that was really the only issue. You uh, don't think it was the district itself? I mean, Governor Otter, when he was in this congressional district when he was a congressman. He won by 70 percent. So perhaps this is just a Republican district and no matter who who runs, and it, maybe Mr. Minnick got elected because people didn't like Mr. Sally, but it's a Republican district and somebody's always going to win who's Republican. It historically has been a Republican district, no question about that. However, Larry LaRocco served from that district from 1990 until 1994. So this was not the first Democratic congressman to represent that district. What I'm suggesting here is that Walt Minnick had a voting record which was very centrist, in fact, right of center. And on the three big issues about which most people complained, he voted with the Republicans. In fact, some Democrats no, complained that he wasn't Democratic no question, enough for them. No question about it. We have people in our party who uh, were very offended at some of those votes. But when all is said and done, unemployment was too high for any member of Congress serving in a basically Republican district as a Democrat to survive. What, it, about, uh, what about the negative ads? Did that have any influence, the, the, the negative ads that uh, Mr. Minnick started running? Well, certainly we, we saw a wholesale rejection by Idaho voters in the first congressional district of the, the negative ads that Walt Minnick for whatever reason chose to run with regard to the immigration issue and other issues and uh, folks acted very negatively toward those and I think that did have something to do with a 10 point margin at the end of the end of the day. If negative ads had anything to do with this election Keith Allred would be governor tonight. I didn't like the negative ads on either side. I don't think that the level of negativity is attractive to Idaho viewers. Let me just back up, meaning that there were negative ads against oh, Keith Allred by absolutely. Uh, the IACI group and others. The IACI, uh, the Republican Governors Association, poured about $400,000 in the final weeks of the election into uh, the campaign. It was used for negative ads, very misleading ads, but uh, I, I'm not going to try to defend any negativity in political campaigning. I think it's gotten out of hand. Unfortunately, and, and Norm knows this to be true, while most people decry uh, negative ads, in many instances they have proved to be very, very effective. So when the voters finally wake up to what's going on, I think we will see a change. Until then, we're going to have a good deal of negativity in campaign advertising. I think the, I think the real difference is that there are different kinds of quote unquote negative ads and when it's a comparative ad, when you're talking about someone's record, how they voted on something, do you agree with someone that votes that way? That's, that's fair game. People may not like that, they, that you're focusing on the negative, but taking quotes out of context, the kinds of things that Walt did in his ads that by any uh, unbiased, independent opinion said that's wrong, that's not accurate, that's the kind of ad that really, I think, turns people off. We don't know what effect, if any, those ads had. Certainly the misrepresentation of records and the misquoting went on in the Otter ads to just as great, if not a greater extent, than the Minnick situation. Okay, let's, let's move on from the ads. Um, I want to ask you, Mr. Semeco, according to the New York Times, the GOP really focused on these so-called blue dog Democrats uh, this year, like Walt Minnick. Um, they saw them as easy targets, i.e., why should a Republican vote for a conservative Democrat when they can vote for a Republican? Uh, is that what happened here, too? Was there a c concentrated effort on the blue dogs? Well, I can tell you personally from going to Washington, D.C., from talking to folks at the National Republican Congressional Committee, uh, to my good friend and, and law school classmate Michael Steele at the RNC, that the problem this year for Republicans that there were so many races in play, we had a hard time figuring out which ones to focus on. So it wasn't just blue dogs, uh, it was Democrats across the board. And let me ask you, how much effect do you think the Tea Party had? The Tea Party Express put out a press release saying that because Minnick rejected their endorsement and went to, and, and then they gave it to Labrador, that accounted in part for Labrador's win. And I believe we have footage of uh, Mr. Labrador talking to the Tea Party early on in his campaign. How much of an effect do you think the Tea Party folk have? had? None. None. No, I, I, I really do not. The, the, the Tea Party, if, if you're talking about an idea, 
then you're talking about a group of voters that may identify themselves with the Tea Party. If you're talking about the Tea Party as an organization, as a structure, they're not a party. They have nothing to do with tea. Uh, many of their leaders are former members or current members of the John Birch Society. Uh, I, I don't believe that they had anything to do with this election. Right. I, I love to hear this because Tea Party folks, and tea doesn't stand for tea, it stands for taxed enough already. Tea Party folks are everyday Idahoans. And I was there in April, on April 15th of 2009. I was in the middle of that crowd. People coming off of work, people with their kids, they were frustrated, they're upset with the direction of the country, and they're coming out, they're engaged, they're motivated voters, and we embrace them. We love having the Tea Party involved. I, let me say this, Marcia. The so-called Tea Party, the, the people who are really at the heart of the Tea Party, don't represent a danger to the Democrats long term. They do represent a danger. They'll have to be dealt with in one way or another by the Republican Party. Let me ask you, Mr. Work, what do you think of Raul Labrador, our newest congressman? Well, I, I know Raul. I, I've worked with him before. Uh, he's a good businessman. I think he's, uh, he's a good lawyer. No question about that. Uh, I think some of his beliefs are positively bizarre. Repealing the 17th Amendment is something that strikes terror in my heart. Uh, he's going to be more typical of the Bill Sally uh, congressman than he is, for instance, of, of Larry Craig, when Larry Craig was in that job. But I can't predict what he's going to do or what issues are going to surface. I'm sure that he will do his best with his philosophical limitations to represent the district. All right, let's get a call in from Cecilia in Boise. Cecilia, go ahead, please. Yes, um, I would like to inquire that uh, um, since we live in a capitalist nation, how is it possible for the two parties to ever get along when both are concerned mainly with the distribution of money uh, that Democrats want it spread out and the Republicans want it controlled? Um, how can we all get along with each other if that's the situation we're Thank facing? <laughs> Thank you very much, Cecilia. There are basic philosophical differences between parties. Uh, what's your sense? Are, are people, you know, nationally now people are talking about this a lot. How are the parties going to get along, especially after such a rancorous election? Well, it's a great question, and uh, you know, the Republican Party stands for a number of things. The Democrat Party stands for other things. Um, can we get along? And we're going to see in the next several uh, weeks with Barack Obama. Really, the, the ball is in his court now. Is he going to work with the new majority that the Republicans have in the House, or is he going to continue to advocate the policies that have been rejected by the American people? That will define the 2012 election, I think. Your sense of getting along? Well, it, it, things vary from year to year, Congress to Congress. I, I think during the years 1995 uh, up right, until 2006, right. The Republican majorities in, in Congress went out of their way to be vile and, and rancorous. I don't think we've seen that in the last four years, but I think Norm has a point. When you have a president who has at least one house of Congress that is controlled by the other party, you have a very tense situation. That doesn't mean that it can't be productive. And I agree with Walt, I, or with, with Norm, I think within the next six months, we'll have some sense of, of what that emotional temperature is going to be. Well, let's talk about uh, somebody who wanted, you know, who said his main uh, part of his campaign was injecting civility into, into public uh, and political life, and that was Keith Allred. Let's talk about the gubernatorial race. We have a graphic that shows the results here. Uh, Democrats are quite ex excited about this candidate, Keith Allred, but uh, Mr. Rourke, he only got 147,000 votes or so, 32.8%. Uh, in 2006, Jerry Brady got if, uh, you know, I've look, looked back, 199,000 votes, 44.1 percent. Yeah. What happened here? Um, people were very excited, I know, in your party about this candidate. That's a, that's a disappointment. There's no question about it, because I think Keith Allred brought something that we haven't seen in Idaho politics, certainly not, not in my lifetime. Uh, and, and he did lose, and he lost badly, no question about that. But he was hit by the same tsunami that hit all Democrats in, in the state of Idaho, and it was very, very difficult. Here's what I think, historically, you need to remember. Democrats do badly in presidential years and in the off-year election when a Democrat is president of the United States. 
this falls into the second category. And consequently, what we saw here in 2010 was very similar to what we saw in 1994. Uh, it's, it's hard to get around, very hard. What do you think of this candidate? Well, I, I'm not sure we have enough time to, to go into detail, but a couple of things. Number one is uh, Butch Hodder is a tremendously popular public figure in Idaho. That's number one. Number two, if the message to Washington was to change course, the message in Idaho is to stay the course, make those tough budget cuts, make those tough decisions. And the third thing is um, Keith Allred, I know him personally, great guy, did the best job that he could. Um, he doesn't have any political experience. He really was coming uh, from, from nowhere and uh, just was not able to get up to the level. Um, nobody coming off the bench for the Democrats that could run a, a really a credible campaign. And I think that was a major, major factor in this race. It's always uh, interesting and amusing when I hear a Republican talk about uh, political experience. So much of the Republican platform, so much of the Republican message is, we need people who are not career politicians. Nobody in this race has spent as much of his lifetime drawing government checks uh, than uh, Butch Otter. And so to talk about experience, I think begs the issue. I need to ask you, uh, before we take another phone call, Mr. Work, both Mr. Minnick and Mr. Allred, in some ways, distance themselves from the Democratic yeah. Party, uh, wanting to be seen more as independents. And indeed, Allred, in one debate, even said he was an independent with Democratic backing. Has Democrat somehow become a, a, a dirty word? Or why, why didn't these candidates who were running as Democrats want to come out and say, hey, I'm a Democrat? A uh, dirty word may be pushing it a little, <laughs> a little too far. Yeah. There is this issue of messaging, there's this issue of branding, and I think that, that what has happened is that the national brand, which is not particularly popular in Idaho, has rubbed off onto our statewide and local candidates, and I, I have to admit that having the D beside your name is a distinct disadvantage at this time in the state of Idaho. Let us take a call from Glenn in Chalice. Glenn, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you much for taking my call. And I was wanting your two guest sides on how a state like Idaho, for instance, becomes a red state. Okay, thank you very much. Uh -huh. What do you think the transition is? Because, of course, as we talked about earlier, there have been Democrats elected from the 1st Congressional District. The, you know, Governor, I mean, uh, Governor Andrus is Democrat. There was a time when a lot of North Idaho voted Democrat. What do you think m turns the tide and makes a state become a, a Republican state? Well, you know, when, when Butch Otter and I uh, convened a unity call a couple months ago with all of our candidates statewide, we, we reemphasized and reiterated that the Republican Party stands for certain things, fiscal responsibility, for limited government. But what makes the turn? For personal responsibility. And what makes the turn is that Idahoans agree with that. When they understand that the party stands for those principles, that's what makes Idaho become a Republican state. Now there but you are, and I have talked about this before. Yes, there are there other things split, with regard to North Idaho. Yeah. With, with no doubt, in, 19, in the early 1990s, um, there was a split, in my view, between labor and environmentalists, particularly in the Lewiston area. And ever since then, you've seen it very tough for uh, Democrats to win in North because Idaho. Because the labor, the foresters in particular perceived that the environmental laws were being hard on them. The lunch bucket Democrats left the, the fold and, and went to the Republican Party. What's your sense? Is it, out, is, I mean, one, some people say it's people moving in from, from California who are very conservative who have made uh, Idaho an even redder state. Several factors, one of which I think Norm correctly identified. Uh, number one, when the Republicans managed to get right to work passed, they dealt a very serious, almost death blow to organized labor. And that was very hard on the Democratic Party. Secondly, a lot of those lunch bucket jobs have simply disappeared. The, the mines and the mills do not employ anywhere near the number of people they once did. Forest industries, including mills and the lumberjacks, that has changed. The influx, particularly in North Idaho, the new population, tends to be very conservative. They're people who in large measure have moved from urban areas. They like the landscape because it, uh, it shows them low property taxes and lots of white faces. That has changed the demographics of North Idaho and it's been very, very hard on the Democratic Party. 
I wish the show could be longer, but it's not tonight. Uh, let's move on, and because these are such interesting issues, um, let's t take a look at the superintendent race real briefly uh, between Luna and Olson. Uh, Tom Luna pulling it out here. Uh, did he get more votes than even Butch Otter? He did. There wasn't and, an independent uh, in this race right. like there was in that race. So, so you know, uh, when he first started running, he, he he didn't seem to be very well respected. Now look at these numbers. Stan Olson, for, uh, super, former superintendent of the school district down here, had a good reputation. Uh, traditionally, Democrats have come out in numbers to vote for their candidate for superintendent of public instruction. Any thoughts here? Or? Well, the longest serving superintendent of public instruction was Jerry Evans, a Republican. Mm -hmm. We've done a little better in that race, but for only eight years did we control the race uh, in the last 20. Uh, this is a big disappointment to all of us because Stan Olson is an educator. He's a well-respected administrator. Tom Luna never taught school, never was a principal, never was in administration. Uh, it, it just is a sad day for Idaho's school children. Whether he got 263,000 votes or he won by three votes, I, I think it's a disappointment. Well, I've, I have a completely different view on it. Uh, Tom Luna has done a phenomenal job over the last four years with a very bad economy in raising the test scores of Idaho school children. And this race was really defined as uh, an advocate for school children and parents versus an advocate for the teachers' unions. And there just isn't enough on the teacher union side to carry someone to victory. Okay, let's take a brief look at the uh, Senator Crapo's race. He, he won, uh, no surprise there, although some have complimented his uh, opponent for his uh, debating skills and his efforts, Tom Sullivan. And let's move on to uh, the Congressman Simpson's race. He also won. I don't think that that was a surprise. Uh, he's going to have a, quite a bit of power, will he not, in the uh, Congress right now? He's uh, friends with John Boehner. He's on the Appropriations Committee. We'll absolutely. probably he's chair a subcommittee. Absolutely. He's in line a, to a big chair winner. Appropriations subcommittee. A, a, a big winner of the national scene, so to speak, that the House is now back in Republican hands. Absolutely. And Mike does, uh, Mike Simpson and Mike Crapo both do phenomenally good constituent work uh, for Idahoans. Now, you talked about uh, Mr. Semenko being a prophet two years ago. Two years ago on this show, you said you were going to target districts 16 and 18, that those were disappointments to you uh, personally. And uh, it appears that um, your prediction, at least in District 18, came true. Let's look at some local races here. And uh, for state senator in District 18, which was Kate Kelly's former seat, Mitch Toriansky, it looks like, has won over Brandon Durst. And for state representative in District 18, Brandon Durst's old seat, Julie Ellsworth and Jane Ward Engelking are neck and neck. This is going to be an automatic vote recount. But you said you were going to work on District 18. Apparently you did. Well, District 18 is very competitive. It was very close uh, last time. It was very close this time. Uh, there were other districts that we focused on around the state, but certainly 18 was big. Let me say this. Uh, what happened in this race? is that the new voters that Barack Obama brought out in 2008 didn't show up for us this time. And I believe that's and, what you said two the, years ago yeah. might happen. And the, the people who show up to vote against Barack Obama were there this time. So we lost in the second congressional district somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 votes. I think but really? for that, that yes, yeah. but for that fact, these races, which are competitive, Norm mm -hmm. is correct, they would have gone to Democrats. I think they'll continue to be competitive, and I think that's the way it is. I wish all 35 districts in the state were competitive. I think our political life, the body politic itself, would be much, much better off if they were. Well, let's take a look at a few more local races. Uh, state representative from District 2, Position A, this was an interesting one. Mary Lou Shepard, the incumbent, lost to Shannon McMillan. I know this was a surprise to even you, uh, Norm. You told me earlier. You know, given the Republican wave, it's not necessarily a surprise that Mary Lou Shepard lost and that Shannon McMillan won. It's the margin, the 10 percent margin that, that really bounced off the page at me that uh, on Tuesday night. Let's put that graphic back up again. George Saylor's seat, he was a Democrat in uh, District 4, Position B. Also a Republican won, Kathleen Sims. Any comments on these uh, uh, as to, Yeah, as to Mary Lou, uh, and, and I, I mean no disparagement here, but uh, she is living proof of the fact that if you call yourself a Democrat but you continue to vote as a Republican, 
sooner or later, a real Republican is going to come along and beat you in an election. Let's take a look at two other uh, losses for the Democrats. State Representative from District 7, Position A, uh, Jeff Nesset, a Republican, won over an incumbent, Liz Chavez. And in uh, District 29, Position B, Jim Guthrie, uh, one took James Rookty's old seat. Um, These were two of the areas that we targeted this time. And I wish every race could be like the Nesset Chavez race. Two wonderfully popular people, very good advocates. Um, and it just came down to, in no negative advertising, just came down to who folks like better in terms of the philosophy. And I wish all the races could have been like that. And you did pick up uh, a gain in the State House, uh, Mr. Wark, uh, Senator Schroeder's old seat. Um, he, he's a Republican, was taken by Dan Schmidt, a Democrat. Um, yeah, well, that, that and, proves and my point about the Tea Party. That is a gift to the Democratic Party by the Tea Party. Because Gresham yeah, was yeah, the Yeah, they, the they took out a good Republican candidate replaced him with a very weak candidate. We took advantage of the situation. We have another senator. I'm so glad to hear Keith acknowledge Republicans as good, at least some of them. And that, that was just a tough you race. You Norm, uh, I've always acknowledged La you. Latah La County is very tough. We always have uh, close races up there, so that was not really a surprise. So we're left with uh, the, the Democrats. The House is down to uh, 57, rep it's 57 Republicans and down to 13 Democrats. Senate stays the same, 28 Republicans and seven Democrats. You lost five seats overall if the votes counts still stand. Now the Gallatin Group, which was founded in part by Governor sure. Andrus, a Democrat, says, said today in a, in a release that Idaho Democrats have now gone from being marginalized to an afterthought. Pretty tough words. Um, what do Democrats, well, we, with a minute left, it's not even really fair. We'll continue this in the web extra. But what do you see as the Democrats' relevance right now in Idaho? Well, it, this is not the lowest number of seats that we've had. We've been down further than this in, in 2001, for instance. There are some things that can be done. There are some things that will be done. But if we have this tsunami of anti-administration voters showing up on a regular basis, then what is already a tough job becomes nearly impossible. But, but you see, still see relevance for Democrats in Idaho. Oh, ab absolutely. We, we are going to continue to be the party of conscience. We are going to continue to call foul where we see foul. We are going to continue to be relevant. We're not going away. Two things. One is I can't speak on behalf of Republican legislators, but I can tell you that, that the Democrats that are in the legislature are respected. They're part of the process. They are heard, and the votes are taken, and the Republicans usually uh, win the day. But they are respected and part of the process. The second thing is I remember 1990, and I remember the election night party that night, and only Larry Craig uh, and Lydia Justice Edwards won that night. The Democrats won everything else. So things can change, and uh, we're not taking anything for granted. Okay, thank you very much. And for those of you holding on the lines, we will get to you in our web extra, which is streamed live, by the way, on our internet uh, now, on our website. So I want to thank both of my uh, guests tonight, Norm Semenko and Keith Rourke. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for tuning in to Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.